check yet? Am I supposed to get one? Yeah, right. But, yeah. By the way, I, I don't know. Are, is, are we supposed to get one? By the way, internets, welcome back to another episode of Salts and Sneakers. I'm here with my good friend, Asadullah Ali. I'm your host, as always, Mahinda Podcaster. And I guess we're talking about stimulus checks corona for Corona. <laughs> like, how do they determine who, for, how, like, I never got a stimulus check in the first place earlier in really? the year. You didn't? Yeah. No. I think you're supposed to. I heard it, it seems to be pretty arbitrary of how they. Really? Yeah. I don't know how they pick. You filed your taxes, right? I did. Yeah, I filed my taxes. Sure that, that's uh... you know, I, I don't know. I I, I, heard, I heard a lot of people didn't get it. Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay. I mean, I've had a job for the most part. Maybe that's yeah, why. That's good. No, I think, <laughs> I think I don't think that's the reason. They're supposed to go out to everyone, right? Unless you're so, making like over a hundred thousand, I don't want to talk about your. Oh house. yeah, yeah. Th- that that explains it. Uh, like oh, my, really? my, my household income is uh, kind of. <laughs> It's is 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 um kind of high. What kind of job do you do again? <laughs> um, go. it's more like what my wife does. Mm. All right, we don't have to go into that, but I, <laughs> I didn't realize. I was like, wow. I, I mean, all, all, all I'll say is like, um, well, she, she births babies. That's what she does. She's she's like she's, oh. an obst- she's an obstetrician gynecologist. Mashallah. Okay. I thought mm-hmm. that was like pretty common because I, I I always get hate mail from these sisters. Who are like, how can you dare talk about polygamy when you're the wife's the one that makes all the money? And I'm like, I'm just joking about it. Like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I mean, that would be a legitimate concern if you were being serious. Yeah, I can see what you're trying <laughs> you to know. say, but, but you know. I mean, but but what if she was willing to like foot the what if she was like, you know, saw his opportunity to her to get some more help? I mean, some I I I used to, you know, I think we we have a mutual acquaintance. His first wife actually was like on a campaign. They get him married to a second one and mm. actually succeeded. And that's her business. That's their business. As long you know, as you can treat them both justly, that's halal. It's fine. It's all good. It's actually, and it's funny because the two co-wives are like re, like BFF. They're really tight. And that's fine. But I think most men can't do it though. Sorry? <laughs> most men can't do it. Though. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of like those outlier situations, right? It's, it's uh, where Gira comes in. But, you know, hey, I was, uh, we, I don't know, we were chatting the other day. Um, so I, I, I'm thinking about hiring a personal trainer. Okay. Um, so I, I, I kind of screwed up my shoulder working out. I got like some tendonitis going on. It's kind of my, it's like discomfort. I don't think it's painful, but what I realized was, is that like the program I was following has no warm up, and I was asking around about warm ups. The guys were like, Oh, warm ups or warm up is useless, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so literally I'll go into the gym and I'll grab the weight that I'm trying to like hit on like dumbbells or whatever, or if it's inclined bench or whatever squats and just load up the bar and just go. Right. Right. <laughs> um, uh, because I don't know, like, you know, part of it is, um, and that, and that's kind of led the conversation with this, with this trainer. Cause we were taught, he works, he's, he works out of my gym and I, and I follow, you know, and I've been following his work, you know, on IG and we, we had a call today and he's kind of like, you know, saying like, Hey, I'd be, I'd love to coach you. And, all that obviously there's a price point with it um yeah, probably pretty heavy one right you know it, it yeah it's it's decent it, it's something like it's, it's something i could do it's not like undoable but it's more like i i i have um i don't have reservations i have i don't have reservations about the concept of coaching i okay. have reservations because i've paid people in the past for stuff um for like coaching services and i got like like sometimes like the only thing I learned in those processes was uh, that that coaching service sucked. That's what I- <laughs> you know, really uh, coaching service, like personal trainers are really just there to motivate you. You can find a lot of this information online for free now um, from experts, uh, you know, who do exercise and fitness and things like this. But uh, honestly, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can understand where your grief is coming from. I mean, I've, I've, there's also a lot of people who are frauds. <laughs> So, yeah, well, I don't think it's like fraud necessarily. So like, I think that, um, so, so, so one thing that I, I find, you know, cause I have a certain physique that's unique to myself, I think. Right. Um, and I have a certain goal and it's like, I, I do recognize that things aren't like customized when you get a program off a website or a book, it's kind of like gener- generic that'll mm-hmm. hit like things. But like when I, do that but but i think a lot of it is the accountability part 
Hmm. I, yeah. I think that's the value of it. That's what you're really paying. You're paying. Cause I, was talking, I was talking to my wife. I was like, I was telling my wife about it. She's like, listen, you know, first of all, you eat too much red meat. And I'm like, in my head, they're like, that has nothing to do with fat loss. <laughs> Welcome I mean, to America. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but like, I mean, you know, I'm like, listen, I'm like, listen, we've been married 11 years. Obviously, you're not holding my feet to the fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, like, my goal physique, my goal weight would probably be to get back to like what I was when I was married. And that's all <laughs> hard for all of us, I think. You know, so. but I, but I, I think, I think what we pay for is this, this guy that just like a coat, because I don't think like the, the, I don't necessarily think it's, a, it's the stuff that's, um, like we don't, I think some of it's lack of knowledge, right? Mm. But I, I think we live, I think we're in an environment when there is, there's just so much noise. Everyone is um, chiming in with their own take and there's confusion. Yeah. You know, and I think that's maybe where the value of a coach, if a coach who knows what he's doing, you kind of just dial into that coach and you ignore everybody else. Yeah, and, and it also, it also has to do with personal experience because everyone's body is different. Like you said, metabolism is different. Yeah people's experiences are different so their version of working out may not work for you yeah for them very well uh but generally speaking though i can say with a great deal of confidence that saying that you don't need a warm-up is pretty bad just (laughs) bad advice (laughs) so um has 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 exercise always been a part of your routine uh yes um although i don't get as much of it as i want to these days but um yes it's just a integral part of how i live um it's just by habit is that something even growing up you were into uh not so much i mean like like, of course like any other kid like running around and climbing things and breaking random objects but you know uh but uh, it didn't become like a formal like habit of mine until probably my teenage years uh when i needed to learn how to fight so Mm. yeah can you talk a little bit about, you know, like you were, you feel like you were forced to learn how to fight in, yeah, as a teenager? I I've always been a kind of a, I was always kind of a small kid growing yeah, up. Yeah. I mean, I'm still very short compared to most adults these days. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I was always sort of a target for a lot of bullying, a lot of physical harassment. In fact, I still have scars from when I was young uh, being hurt by my peers. Um and um and i'm not talking about emotional scars i'm talking about physical ones yeah and um so eventually yeah i mean i grew up in pretty rough neighborhoods and uh you know you can only learn so much but when you're going up against kids who are like twice your size and pounded on you you know that's you have to learn something a little bit more uh, official to take it <laughs> so yeah eventually i got into martial arts as a result of that and that sort of stuck with me for the rest of my life now so i got my uh when I, I I'm probably in the same boat. I was always the smallest. Kid. I was always the youngest kid in my class. Wow. Oh, that's so, <laughs> so my uh, the thing is, we. I remember when I found this out. I, so so my um, my parents rushed to get me into like the next grade when I was when I was really young. So I was like the young. I, I'm like I was been the youngest. Anyways, um, as much as I can reveal, there's some more stuff there, but okay. <laughs> um. So yeah, I was always the smallest kid. Um, I never got into fights. I never really got picked on too much. I wouldn't say. I think my experience was is that like kids every now and then people will say something to you, but it was just like yeah, whatever. Um, you know, you say something back, maybe yeah. it, it never escalates. But um, my experience, it like there was one year when my eighth grade year, I was I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, as many of the listeners know, oh, nice. and sorry. Yeah, I forgot about you. <laughs> you did that. Yeah, so it was a nice place. <laughs> yeah, eighth grade um, was I, I got bust into the hood, right? And um, this is like one of the worst part. But the kids were coming from all over, and my experience was that like as long as you didn't talk any mess, no one was gonna me- no one was gonna mess with you. Yeah. Right. And I did. I didn't. I didn't have like. I didn't go. People will like see me now, and they see me like mouth on a podcast. I'm like, yeah, I, I would joke around, but it's different. I, I still don't. Like I, I'm not about like ex- in rare circumstance, am I gonna go after some go after somebody? Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think totally back then just, people just talk smack for the sake of talking shit. And it's just I think actually today people are more sensitive, even like the so-called people from the hood and the gangster types. Like, yeah. very, like you know, like back then you used to we like you, you know, when we growing up, you could mouth off and stuff, right? 
but uh, generally speaking, fights didn't occur unless something like severe was said or people were really trying to pick on. Um, in my case, you know, I talk back, you know, <laughs> so that's why I got beat. But the thing is, um, like now, yeah, you got to be even more careful, I think, like even like the slightest thing will set somebody off. And so it has to do with a lot of anxiety. And I think just this uh, compensation that's going on now with like the identity crisis of the world. I don't want to get too philosophical, but yeah, yeah that's right, my right. perception. But yeah, like there used to also be honor in fighting too. Mm. Like at least from, from my perspective, like it used to be like one-on-one -on -one fights. Most people didn't, like if you got jumped, that was kind of rare because people kind of saw that as cowardly, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I, I, I remember this one fight, me and my, me and my one, uh, I had a lot of Afghan friends growing up. They're still my friends to this day. And uh, there was these two cousins, Jake and Eddie. Um, they they were, you know, like white trailer trash types. Oh. You know? <laughs> um, we used to play football. We were always cool and stuff. But then every, occasionally, you know, sometimes with kids, they just want to fight for the sake of fighting. There's nothing to do. Like, oh, we're bored. Oh, we played football yesterday. Let's beat each other up now. <laughs> yeah. So I think one day there was like, I think something, it was like something stupid. It was like something like benign. And so me and my boy Ashraf, right. They wanted to fight me and Ashraf and Ashraf at the time, he's, he's much taller than me now. Right. He, you know, he was younger than me. He was a little small, but I was like, Hey, you take, you handle Eddie was a smaller kid. I'll handle Jake. You handle Eddie. Just get rid of Eddie as soon as possible. Just like push him aside and help me with Jake. So like we were going one-on-one -on -one. Jake was having me. And then, but Ashraf took care of his little kids because cousin Eddie and then he jumped me. Right. So. And they jumped in. And then, uh, long story short, a couple of days later, his mom comes to my house. <laughs> right. My mom, I'm taking a nap after school. I, I think I was in ninth grade. Right. But remember, I'm still really pretty small. I was probably barely clearing five foot at the time. <laughs> um, so, you know, maybe like 80 pounds or something. My mom, you know, mom likes to be up. She's like, hey, so, you know, she wants to come to the front door. And she's like, what's going on? And then she's like, uh, Jake's mom looks at me, and then she looks. She's, he looks at him. He's like, he's not big. It's like, mom, he's in ninth grade. It's like, so <laughs> he's not big. He, you're as big. You're bigger than him, right? <laughs> so, I mean, in, in general, though, we I, I avoided him. Um, I had friends that always ran into him. And stuff. Yeah, it's just it just. But you today you meet people that you could tell like you never. I, I don't think I've gotten punched in the face in like a long time. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I wonder about that though. I'm like, is that am I is that does that make me soft and stuff? But real quick, back back to oh, the, why would that make you soft? I don't know. Just uh, it's good to avoid fights whenever you can. Yeah, <laughs> not fun to get hit in the face. <laughs> you know, like what? Like yeah, I'm I'm a man because I like getting hit in the face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but back to all like fitness and stuff though. Um, one thing I've noticed, I think I think what you know, I think holds back Muslims. Specifically, I know this isn't just a Muslim show, but Muslim specifically about like um, getting in shape, especially Zabiha only Muslims. What is be is because we like go nuts every time there's like a new halal restaurant that opens up. <laughs> it's like like there, I mean, there's what's there's WhatsApp groups that are just like, oh, this spot opened up and this spot opened up, and it's like you gotta hit, you know, and. I'm like, if you're eating that, and it usually, I mean, 99% of the time, it's not healthy for you. So yeah. you're you're making these rounds, and you're it's impossible to like get in shape. I don't know, like what are your, and I I don't, and often I see that the guys who are not into um, that scene as much are able to avoid it, or either oh they're not Z, um, non Zabiha, then they kind of have an advantage in that. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Food I mean, culture. Yeah, I, think, I think Muslims love to eat. I mean, you know, if you go to Malaysia, for example, you're, you're bound to gain a couple of pounds. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there is a cultural mentality and I don't know exactly where it comes from, but I do feel like it has something to do with sort of the laziness of a lot of Muslims, <laughs> to be frank, you know, not just in, uh, not just with like work ethic, but also in terms of education and just general laziness that, that kind of has gone around. And I think that men, in the Ummah, not all of them, obviously, but many do have this perception that they don't need to be fit in order to be considered, you know, manly. <laughs> um, but in our tradition, I mean, you know, from what I understand and historically as well, is that men had to be fit because they had to prepare for jihad. And they had to prepare, you know, to protect their family members, etc. 
And uh, but I, I think that a lot of the pampering that's been occurring, especially in the Arab world, has kind of um, what is it dismissed that as a necessity. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you look at the Arab countries, especially Gulf countries, and I'm sorry to be stereotypical, but you walk in Dubai for a second, you can see it. You know, most guys are overweight, man. Yeah, like it's just like why, you know, and it's because they're pampered. They have everything handed to them. They don't understand the value of of being fit and being, you know, uh, needing to be healthy for their family members. They don't consider these things to be valuable, and they're not taught to to consider these things valuable. At least from my, from what I can see. Um, so, I mean, that's my personal opinion. I could be wrong. So. What do you think about what do you see in, in America, though? I think America, the thing is, yeah, you have that same sort of mentality among a large portion of the population, you know, but it's also regarded culturally as being something to be ashamed of, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's a reason that there's so many fitness clubs. There's a reason that that there's a, there's a movement within the United States regarding fitness, regarding getting fit, you know, um, because, you know, everything, everyone generally understands that being obese or at least being unhealthy to some degree is considered to be unattractive. Right. Or, the very least, you know, or something that you should not aspire to be. Even you, you have people doing the fat acceptance movement. That's a s- extreme minority. Most, even most fat people don't agree with that. <laughs> you know, like, that's like, come on, you know, like, yeah, this is unhealthy. We know this is problematic, but I don't see that same mentality in the Muslim world in many places. I really don't see it. I, I think the minority in the Muslim world is like, yeah, we have to be fit. Um, and that's unfortunate. And maybe it's because, you know, we are concerned with other things. But. I find that in in the American Muslims is that I th- I feel like there's a desire to want to be fit, but like yeah. there's no guidance. No people don't know what they're doing. So I don't know if you got caught up in the. I feel like two years ago, everyone was doing keto. Keto, yeah. No, I never got caught up in that. No. You know, <laughs> um, you know. So you, you know, there's a couple guys. I don't know if you know, if like from Chicago, like Wally Khan. You know, you know Wally. I think so. I don't the remember. Nur- the, he's a the, 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 the nurse. He's a nurse. He's a um. He's he, well. I'm like, if you're not Instagram, you might not know. He's a, he's got like a big following. On. Yeah, but he he he's from the yeah he's like he I think he used to compete. Um, oh, but he he's advised guys like you know like socket you know like people in our community and whatnot. But in general, I don't think people have like guidance, hmm. and there's also like this you know there's so many different theories out there that everyone gets caught up in some theory because of the guy they like the guy they run in some circle yeah and that's what kind of generates it so i, I to me i feel like there's a desire but there just seems to be like a lack of guidance and we all end up yo-yo dieting yeah i think you know there is a lack of guidance i agree with you because there's no mentors right you don't have many mentors because i mean even look at our spiritual leaders and i'm sorry i gotta be frank and i'm not saying this is an insulting way but there are too many shayuk out there who are obese. Mm-hmm. This is wrong. Right. I'll be frank. Like This is wrong. Like, you know, you can't be sitting here saying you have to be a protector and maintainer of women, but you have a problem even being, curing your own gluttonous behavior. You know what I mean? And I'm sorry, this is, a, everyone has flaws. I'm not trying to be disrespectful because these people are people of knowledge and we should respect them, but they have to also manifest that in a, in a physical way as well. You know, they have to take care of their bodies. The many of the Shiuk in the past used to fight in battles. They used to fight in Jihad. You know, nowadays I can't think of many Shiuk who would be able to do that. Mm-hmm. No offense. I'm just saying, you know, being Frank, you know, and um, also, you know, yeah, there is a lack of guidance. And I think there's also uh, this perception that it's too complex to get into like, Oh, we have to do a bunch of complex and complicated things in order to get healthy. And it's like, no, you don't. I mean, and, and I'm sorry to bring up one of these people because maybe it seems contradictory because you said, you know, follow a certain crews, so follow certain people, you know, that's a problem. But like, you know, Bruce Lee, for example, is somebody that I admire tremendously for fitness. Mm. Right? I take off, I take after his program. He was very simple. Eat three times a day, eat healthy meal, you know, work out 45 minutes a day, what you can. That's all you need to do. You don't need to like, you know, push yourself too much. Um, and he was, a, he was probably one of the most fit people that I've ever seen in my life. I never saw him personally, but you know, that I know of. Right. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if people just like, but I think there's also like my wife and I were talking just now about like the whole personal trainer business. Right. And she's like, you know, I guess she's like, if you want to pay for it, you can, it's just all about like, maybe it's everyone's personality is different. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's just like certain things are like the Bruce Lee. That's like some people like intermittent fasting. Yeah. As a, as they, that's a way for them to get their calorie restriction in because 
they are it's it suits their lifestyle they're able to do it that way some people are like they can do the four to five meals a day or whatever yep. three meals like you know that what bruce lee did where it's you know some things people have to account for like not not so much under corona but like if you're if you're daisy you got all these invitations all the time it's yeah. like the thing is too like you, you have to keep in account like if you're going to eat a lot you got to work out a lot right yeah people don't realize that you know you can eat as much as you want but right but sometimes it's even like there's even limits to that it's even like you can't like go beyond like it depends what you what yeah. your what your goals are too yeah so i think it's just the culture doesn't like i remember was it like i was doing this thing called the whole 30 maybe like okay. two years ago that was the hardest nutrition thing i ever had to do really because it required like elimination of a lot of things it was only 30 days but like um. Um, I couldn't have rice. I couldn't have like anything oh, with added sugar, God. no desserts. I mean, I could have potatoes, like, you know, if it was like, Yay. like steamed potatoes <laughs> and stuff, but like, obviously not French fries, nothing fried, nothing with MSG. Um, so yeah, man, I was just, uh, and so I remember going to the invitation and like, couldn't eat, like, what I, what could I eat there? Like chicken and salad. That's all I, 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 I took like chicken and salad and ketchup. Right. Not even no, no ketchup has MSG. Oh yeah, God. <laughs> has yeah. added sugar, right? So all that stuff is like, I lost fourteen pounds in a month. Oh, but I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. It might be unhealthy. <laughs> Actually, I'm thinking like fourteen pounds in a month. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's also like some people say you, they're supposed to, and I, I, but I think long and, and the idea is like, oh, that shows you we can restrict. I was like, you know, but yeah, you, you go to invitation. It's just like people are like, in you know, they got some. It's usually dessert that gets me. They always bring something nice for dessert and <laughs> sweets, man. Yeah, for real. But anyways, uh, w- w- you talked a little bit about your upbringing. You you, you kind of grew up in a tough in some tough neighborhoods. W- w- or did you grow up in Chicago? No, I didn't grow up in Chicago. I eventually settled there. Uh, I grew up in Miami and Houston. Ah, uh, okay. So and then I kind of mixed with that same crowd when I got to Chicago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, ethnically, you you are Spanish, like from Spain itself. Yeah, I'm Spanish. Okay, like how, how, what generation? What gen? No, yeah. like my, my whole family's purebred. We call purebred Spanish. Like so, uh, my mother, well, actually, my grandparents moved to Puerto Rico, and to get into the United States, and then they finally got to New York, and that's where my mother and father were born. Mm-hmm. Right, and then they got married. And then I was born in Florida. I got gotcha. you. Now, what part? Like, are, are they from northern Spain or are they from Andalusia? They're from Andalusia. Would you know what city? Uh, we had like a farm. Apparently, there was a farm. We don't know much. We there was a farm outside of Cordoba. Oh yeah. Oh, so there was a or sorry, excuse me. Yeah, um, it was in a farm territory down south, but we don't know exactly exa- the, the specific location of that my grandpa my grandmother doesn't have much information other than that so i i, I don't know if I, t- I told you we i was actually in andalusia uh this yeah, year yeah you told me yeah yeah did the whole like beautiful place yeah southern spain uh morocco two-week vacation right before corona hit wow it was beautiful right kind of depressing too probably <laughs> um well no you know what granada i feel like there's so have, when's that have you i assume you've been back at some point no you've no, never been no okay so i'll I've tell you pictures. i'm sorry i've seen pictures i've had stories from my so i felt like there's hope in i feel like so in granada we you know you go to alhambra and everything but mm. like there's a new mosque they built there yeah right outside. yeah yeah and you from the courtyard it's actually like a tourist attraction because people mm. will go to the courtyard and like they can see the alhambra lit up at night you know yeah um so i think we were there there was like a spanish sister that took shahada at maghrib time so you know we we talked to some of the brothers who like who run the who run the place and they were like yeah there's definitely an interest there's people that are looking to reconnect with their roots there you know because spain is just no different in europe with the secularization with the with the downfall of christianity yeah i would say they're far more anti-muslim though yeah than most places okay <laughs> uh, uh yeah From um where- Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I just did. I, I, I didn't feel the. Um, I didn't get that vibe though. Personally, now, grand, I, we were they could see we're tourists, but my wife wears hijab and everything, and you know we were at you know every time we, we 
and we found some halal spots to eat at. There's a really good Thai place I found in Granada. And um, Luthia has got a lot of, I mean, I mean, that's where the primary Muslim concentration is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I just, I, I think about it. The more that I think about the history, the more that I think about the Alhambra and other things is like, it's very depressing. And I don't know if I'd ever want to see that um, mm-hmm. personally. I mean, I, I understand it's a beautiful place, but it's also yeah. a recollection of how we fell. And now that the fact that it's been converted into a museum that you're not even allowed to pray in, mm-hmm. you know, it's like that to me is like... Well, you saw that at Cordoba, the, the, the cathedral mosque, like the Catholics have their service. Yeah, but there's no Muslim service that's permitted yeah, there, right? Yeah, you it's, know, it's really it's really a slap to the face, and that's sort of a it's implicit within Spain. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure you realize this, but if the farther you go up north, pork is sort of a <laughs> pork is everywhere, and it's it's but it's not a Spanish thing because it's like inherent in Spanish culture. It was a, it became Spanish because they wanted to determine who was Muslim or not Muslim during the Inquisition, mm-hmm. so they started to incorporate pork more into the cuisine. So they could sort of demarcate between who was Muslim mm-hmm. or not Muslim, because you know they couldn't tell the Moriscos, they couldn't tell who was really converted to Catholicism or who was you know in hiding their Muslim identity. Right. So you know it's it's a it's a constant reminder that pork is there, not because oh Spanish love pork, mm-hmm. but because you know it, because it became part of the culture just to discriminate against us. That's true, but I, I think there's, you know, you know, like things are cyclical, right? Uh, you know, so we, we, you go to Sevilla, they have, like, I think, Freddy Canute. He used to play, uh, play soccer for Sevilla Football Club, mm-hmm. and he's he's leading. The, there's a there's a new mosque project they got going. You know, he's probably to get alerts for it and stuff. So, yeah. anyways, yeah, you know, my Miami, Houston, kind of grew, grew up in these rougher neighborhoods. Um, religiously, what was your family like background? My mother's Catholic. Uh huh. My my my. You know, my father was also from that sort of background, but uh, I didn't know him. Um, You know, he left when I was like one years old, but apparently he was also from that background. Um, So uh, when my mother remarried, she remarried in uh, a guy, a man who's, you know, he's still my my stepfather now. Uh, He came from a Protestant Christian background, but he's atheist. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the type. My parents are Catholic and atheist. (laughs) So that's really secular I, I would imagine it would be a second you know I, I i don't know how these how these marriages work no they don't I mean, I mean, it's far, from, from, a, from a faith yeah from a faith point of view right i mean people can like they'll you know you you hear about people that are like oh they'll they'll compartmentalize this what and whatnot but yeah. I, I i just don't get it um yeah so anyways you uh so when did like what was your own outlook though were you thinking about things like philosophy and god as a kid or was you just trying to like make it through the streets <laughs> I really didn't care too much. I've always been kind of an inquisitive person, but I never really thought about like philosophy, like as a formal thinking process or as something I wanted to get into. Um, yeah. And as a teenager, I kind of went through, I guess you could say an anti-religious phase, sort of quasi atheist phase. And in my twenties, I think after kind of going through like engaging in criminal activity and finally kind of like going to jail and stuff that kind of flipped my mind. A little bit because I started to take religion a little bit more seriously. I had a lot of depression issues. I had a lot of issues when I was a teenager up to my twenties. Mm-hmm. So I went through. I mean, my mother got sick, uh, pretty you know, with a rare disease. Um, you know, I I had like a debilitating debilitating injury after fighting. Um, so I was paralyzed for a couple of months, and uh, you know, all of this stuff just cumulative and sort of like this identity crisis. So eventually, I kind of went back to Christianity. But I didn't like Catholicism, so I kind of veered towards Protestantism and then eventually ended up in the Orthodox Church again. And uh, that was basically the extent of my religiosity until I became Muslim. But it was more intellectual. It wasn't really about like... What, 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 what's it like being a Christian? Like trying to like... It like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it, it's, it, it always... <sighs> they, they, the people will tell you, like cur- Christians who are preaching to you will tell you something. But I feel like they're not being authentic. Christianity for mm-hmm. me is like, um, I don't want to sound shallow, like in terms of how I represent it, because I know there's a lot of intellectual Christians out there, but Christianity is more about the abstract. It's more about feeling things than it is necessarily about living them. So for me, at least in my experience as a Christian, you sort of, you get attached to the ideology 
and really the person of Jesus himself and about like what he did and what he or supposedly did and the, the understanding of love and sacrifice. And really it's all, I, mean, I don't want to say this, but this is the best way to represent it, but it's like a personality cult um, in really more ways than, than one. Um, and in that, you know, it's really about the personality of Jesus and what he did for you and everything else but there's no rules. There's not like, there's not really any religion involved. Um, if you think about it from the Islamic perspective of having like Sharia, you know, like guidelines, like the way you live your life, you know, it's, it's more about your connection to a personality and um, manifesting those feelings, that perception in your daily life. But generally speaking, like Christians and atheists and Jews, secular ones don't really behave any differently. Mm -hmm. You can still drink, you can still, I mean, of course, zina or fornication is not allowed in Christianity, but it's not really a subject of discussion outside of the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Uh, most Protestants, I think, are are quite um, okay with those sort of things. Yeah, well, it it depends. Like who you like talk yeah, to, right? It depends, but generally yeah. speaking, I think personally, in my perspective, most of Christianity is just a hobby. A hobby. <laughs> It's a it's a hobby you do on Sundays. Yeah, I, I I would I would say for the masses. So I I, I was uh I, I've had some uh, Pentecostals on this show before. Um, oh, lovely. <laughs> you know they're, they're they're pretty intense. Um, we uh we, we and we and we talked offline. You know, and I I I was I think I think they mean well. It's interesting. You know, they have a, a Latin background, mm. but uh they talk about like sin a lot like mm -hmm. doing sin and as far as like repent you know and so w w one one guy he was talking he was he's gonna you know, have a homosexual lifestyle and then his brother was a like gang but and you know he's like he gave up they, they stopped doing that it's like just because he said i got saved i've been consciously avoiding like watching porn and like and he's like adultery must be called out and stuff like that right these yeah. sins um they and because they, they talk we and we talked and he was like yeah there's because there's a lot of lukewarm christians is it so so to speak that but I would say that's probably like the majority. That's probably the majority in America. It's the majority. I mean, look, I, I've run into people like evangelicals like that too, right? Yeah. The thing is, at the end of the day, it, a lot of it's just talk. It really is, if, if, as far as I'm concerned, because when I see these same people outside, you can't tell the difference, you know. And it's not just about how they dress. I'm not talking about like superficial aspects, like you know, you know, outside appearance. But I'm talking about general behavior. Even their understanding of values is very much embedded in secular ideology mm -hmm. like for me it's, there's really not much difference i mean yeah they say well it's not good to be to to con to, to involve yourselves in adultery and it's you know but um i don't know how to put it it doesn't feel like christianity has much of a grasp in terms of the way people live as it's supposed to because it hasn't really um many of the church leaders i guess or even the church or those in the catholic and orthodox church themselves have not really uh educated their followers or sort of manifested these rules in any significant way and i guess it's because of the lack of political power that they've had over the centuries but uh yeah it, it, it doesn't it, it's not something you feel obligated to be part of mm -hmm. like the one thing yeah the, the one thing i do find with them that's inconsistent is their like rabid support for the G for the republican party well, here in the United States, yeah, yeah, in, in the United yeah. States, uh, like on a single issue, just like on abortion, right? Yeah. Meaning that, like, they look at it like it, it's almost very, it's very formulaic. They're like, okay, abortion is murder. So, because abortion is murder, there are these many deaths being, you know, these are many people are being killed every year, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's more than anything else. And since death is worse, is the worst thing ever, it overrides everything else. Like I said, that there's no value in those words or even that sentiment. It, to me, it's just virtue signaling because these same people who support the GOP are perfectly okay with slaughtering Muslims overseas. I mean, you know, I mean, just be, you know, sorry to be so. Yeah. Uh, but you know, they're they're perfectly fine with supporting, or at least they used to be, until it became, you know, isolationism became popular again over the past decade. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, before this, they were perfectly fine with invading random countries and bombing the hell out of them because they happen to be. From different cultural backgrounds uh -huh. or different races and ethnicities they're perfectly fine with killing mexicans or illegal immigrants if, it, if it's convenient things like this you know and i'm not speaking for everyone but it seems to me that there's a large portion i think they look at it like a numbers game they're like yeah but abortion still kills more yeah well so that's the problem, though. 
is that if you value human life based on numbers by but quantity, yeah. there's an issue there. I mean, what remember the Stalin's famous words, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, one death is a tragedy. A thousand is, is a statistic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, at what point when you start, when you start putting numbers to, 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 val to the value of people's lives mm -hmm. is when you've actually devalued them. I got you. Uh, would, would you say that prison is kind of where you kind of like, okay, that kind of gets I wasn't you into in prison. I want to be frank. I, oh, was, okay. I was in jail, um, which for a little bit of time, but uh, thank God I never went to prison. Okay. So, can, can, so for our non-American listeners, can you explain the difference between prison and jail? Prison's like, prison's worse than jail <laughs> jail Jail's is worse. like yeah jail i mean they can keep you in there for a long time don't get me wrong it's it's more like j jails are like in a lot of police departments and stuff like this they keep people who like petty crimes and things people who are going to go to prison okay yeah. usually or people who are only in there for like a few months or something because you know they've they've caused mischief in the land if you want to say you know uh doing disorderly conduct things like this uh for me I could have gone to prison, but I had a pretty good judge. I don't want to get too much deep into it, but like, you know, he had pity on me for some of the stuff I was going through in my life. So he let me go off, you know, on community service and some fines and all this stuff. But yeah, um, I was in jail for a bit of time for a number of offenses. Uh, among them, the most severe being that I, I had a physical altercation with a police officer. Um, Thank God I wasn't black or he would have shot me, you know, <laughs> just being frank, <laughs> you, know? Right. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I had a fist fight with a police officer. Uh, I was in jail. I also had offenses for theft, vandalism, et cetera, et cetera. So I went down a pretty bad path. Okay. Uh, so, okay. You said you kind of phased into like Protestant Christianity and then it kind of like stagnated for a while or what happened next? Well, yeah, I went to Protestantism just sort of like to rebuild myself because I, I had all this depression. I just got out of jail. You know, I had a lot of issues. You know, I was like, my life was in shambles. You know what I'm saying? So I had to um, kind of build myself up. And it was sort of kind of therapy, like being reconnected to God, having some sort of purpose in life. And, um, and then as I was engaging myself in this community of believers, if you want to call them that, back then um, I started to become, you know, more deep thinking more deeply about religion, about the actual ideas. And that's when I moved into the Orthodox church eventually, because that's when I got involved in the philosophy and things like that. So religion actually was a segue into philosophy. Okay. It was kind of my way of like thinking about the deeper meanings of life and things like that. So like why? Yeah. If, if you're like, so my, my, I think I made some comment on a recent podcast that like, when you look at the different groups of Christianity, I feel like if you're going to be Trinitarian, I always felt like the Catholic way was the way to go. Hmm. I'll tell you why, because I feel like, so Protestantism, as Jeremy McClellan said at our Mad Mom Luke show, he, he called them like the night, like the Quran Yun. Yeah, that's what they <laughs> the are. Quran only <laughs> types. <Yeah, they're... laughs> um, but like, uh, I, I would say that because they, like, they're all Trinitarians, right? So the Trinity, as far as, you know, as I said before, I don't want to beat the be dead horse, but it's from church tradition. It's from these councils, right? Yeah. Which are Roman Catholic in origin. So that's kind of uh, what I was like, isn't it? Or Well, no, I mean, there's a Latin church. There's the Western church and the Eastern church. So the Orthodox okay. church was actually the first church. It's the West who broke away from the East. Okay. So you had a council of bishops and then the West, as it became more separated over time, you know, eventually it became its own thing. Uh, but really Catholicism didn't develop until after. I mean, of course, the, the, the Council of Nicaea was, was integral to Orthodox understanding as well. But generally speaking, they, they diverted in terms of theology in a number of different ways. So for example, original sin is really only a Catholic and Protestant thing. Mm. Original sin does not exist in the same way in the Orthodox Church. Um, it actually doesn't exist at all. And actually, in the Orthodox Church, they regard all human beings as being born innocent, being good. Interesting. Okay. And only inheriting sin as they, you know, in life. They don't, they're not, nobody's born like, you know, on the verge of going to hell. So, so, so the Council of Nicaea, when that took place, that was because that was under the Roman Empire, right? The Byzantine, yeah. I mean, 
<clears throat> yeah, but at the time the churches were the same. Okay. They were only separated by geography, not by not by ideology. Yeah. Okay, and then so so the what what year did like the, you say there's an Eastern and Western? That was split. It like 1054. I forgot exactly. I forgot the exact date. It was during the first crusade. I mean, not during the first crusade, but I think that's when it became most prominent when the Catholic Church sacked the Orthodox uh, churches. Yeah, I forgot. It was in 10 something. So mm. I apologize. I'm not, I don't remember these things. And then I, the Protestant stuff. Okay, okay, I gotcha. Protestantism didn't come yet until much later. Right, right. I gotcha. So uh, what about, uh, so so I guess what, what you, you, you kind of do your thing in Christianity. What were you doing in ta- at the time? Were you going to college or high school or? Like, yeah, you were so, uh, so uh, I got myself back into, so I decided to go to university because um, before I didn't want to, I wanted to become a professional fighter, but that didn't work out after I got injured. So I decided to let me go into college and I got interested in philosophy, both for the religion, but also because of the superficial reason, because I like Bruce Lee we talked about yeah and he was a philosophy major so i was like "Ah, i'll do this right so i got into it and um first two years i did really bad like i was terrible Uh, so i dropped out and then i got i went back to college a couple years later whenever i became a little bit more mature and uh yeah that's that's when i got in in what is it uh and that's when i really started questioning my faith is this in chicago at the time yeah i was in chicago at this time yeah like you know philosophy i was a philosophy major for really? a short time yeah I, I i went through like five majors before i finally became had to settle on mechanical engineering yeah so I was like a philosopher sorry <laughs> sounds like what a philosopher would do <laughs> so. no so so for me i i started my my college journey in toronto oh, i grew yeah. up in ohio but then i went to toronto to go to school at the time the u.s dollar was really strong and uh yeah, I remember uh, I went to engineering for electrical engineering, hated it, computer science, then with computer science, then I realized that the thing I hated about engineering, electrical engineering was the, was the coding. Oh, yeah. So then I was like, you know, I want to go, I was like thinking I want to go to law school. I, I want, my dream job was like to be a sports agent. Okay. I was like, not a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, um, but I was like debating and I wasn't super practicing back then, but at the same time. I was like, yeah, but I'm not going to be going to like, I, I read, the, I read like a, you know, you're from my, I don't know if you're from Miami, you, you might be familiar with Drew Rosenhaus. Um, he's like the big NFL sports agent. So I read his autobiography and so much of it is just like going to strip clubs and bars, taking these clients out, you know, to these, 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 these NFL players, right. Uh, you're whining and dying and I'm going on this boat and all this like parties all the time. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. How, I was like, so is there a way to be the ethical sport? It's like a lot of it is poaching ethical. people too. Is there an ethical sports agent out there? Of all sports agents, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I'm just looking at it, and I'm just like, you know, but um, yeah. So I was, I, 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 started, I decided to. Um, guard philosophy was a good major to get into law school. Like, I guess you would learn something. I thought I was a typical. So I did a year in philosophy. I, I took like ancient philosophy. Bored the hell out of me, man. I was like, I had that big plate. There's a big right. Plato book. <laughs> reading like the cave and all of that stuff. And then political philosophy, I took that like, you know, so I learned John Locke and Mill and those guys. And I don't know, it, it, like, I guess I, I, I think I was young. I was only like 18 or 19. And maybe my maturity level, I, I, I just, like, I felt like my classmates, they wanted to be there. Mm. I felt like I was just there because I was like, oh, I'm just doing this so I, so I can go to law school. But I don't even know why I want to go to law. Oh, I want to go to law school so it looks cool and they wear nice suits and they get paid. Well, I mean, you had the right you had the right path in mind if you're going to law school because philosophy majors are like one of the number one to get into law school. Right. That's what I and that's why I'd read. Right. But I was just like I I had this I was a professor at University of Toronto, Thomas Robinson. He was like supposedly one of like the world experts on like Plato. And I write, I write this paper for him and he get like a C, I get a C. And I was like, I couldn't, I was like, you know, so, and it wasn't because when I was in engineering, the perception was, oh, you go to like liberal arts, it'll be a joke. You'll kill it. And I found that to be not true at all. I uh, go in there and these, and these University of Toronto professors did not mess around. They were like tough. It didn't matter like which discipline you were at. Um, so later I was just like, just taking classes or taking classes. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I got into Amway. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I was like, I don't know why I want to go to college. I told my dad, like, you know what? You know, I don't need to go to college, man. And then finally, he, he next to me, he's like, come back home, come to Ohio. 
we'll get it figured out and you know but i don't know it was kind of like i could never get into it though i would like i don't know how i'd feel I, like you know people these days they talk like philosophy seems to see there seems to be like a rejuvenation of people's interest in philosophy these days by the average person because of someone like a jordan peterson he's not even he's a psychology guy yeah he's more i mean he uses philosophy to his advantage or he tries to use philosophy to his advantage but you know it's not for everyone yeah at the same time i think the reason that there is sort of a resurgence in interest in philosophy is because people just don't know who they are they don't know what they're here for you know it's the same reason that there's i think there's a resurgence in religion you know i hear all these atheists saying oh there's you know atheists going to be a major atheist wave and everyone's going to become atheists in 10 years i'm like it's not going to happen it never because the human soul naturally we're inclined to finding purpose beyond ourselves you know and and, and transcending our own individual like desires and needs because we want we want to be more than what we are so religion is never going to go away because that natural tendency is always there um so you know but uh yeah i think that's the reason why we're living in a postmodern period where people just are so confused about what they're supposed to be doing with their lives mm-hmm. that this has become an interest because they think that that's where the answer is as far as philosophy went for you, like, was there a specific angle that you liked that you enjoyed specifically within philosophy? Um, I mean, when I was first trained in philosophy, I mean, I went to a Catholic, a private Catholic school, Benedictine University. And so all of them were Catholic professors. And um, so we learned primarily from the Thomist and analytical tradition of philosophy. Um, and um, of course, that's what I was interested in at first. But as I learned more and more, uh, especially when I went to Malaysia to study, um, I eventually became a pragmatist. Uh, that's a long story. But... Can you explain like what those actually what those terms actually mean for the for the lay audience? On the analytical philosophy, analytical yeah. philosophy primarily deals with like is tech is more is probably what you would consider the technical philosophy. Um, it deals primarily with formal logic and trying to trying to formulate everything in such a way that is logically consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's almost like you could say even a math. I mean. The philosophy of mathematics is primarily analytical um so um so it's less about the spirit it's less about the purpose of life it's more about trying to find out what truth is trying to find out what certainty is trying to find out what reality is you know uh, in an objective manner if you want to call it that and uh Thomism is a, a catholic philosophy is a neo-aristotelian uh catholic philosophy that was developed by thomas aquinas um so it kind of also introduced into the analytical Catholic tradition. Uh, and then pragmatism <laughs> is not analytical philosophy, but uh, pragmatist, uh, essentially they view uh, truth in an instrumental way. So uh, for me, while, while pragmatists can believe in absolute truth, uh, the methodologies of getting their understanding truth are often regarded as instrumental or as in only valid on the basis of how useful they are in explaining things so uh coherency is more important than um than being able to uh verify um so for example if i you know um i'm trying to explain this as simple as possible uh so coherent anything that is coherent or consistent is more important than whether or not you can point to the thing and say there it is um uh, in, in explaining what that thing is and what it does, uh, making valid predictions, things like this. So, um, or also can working from the perspective of like, is it the best way to survive? Does this help me in understanding who I am? Uh, is this the best way to, to comprehend the world around me? Things like that. So that's what a pragmatist, it's, it's not like uh, what many people take to be like Machiavellian, like, oh, this is what I desire, therefore this is true. Mm-hmm. That's not, or this works to get what I desire. Therefore it's true. Um, it's not like that at all. So it, that's a more complex discussion, I think. <laughs> so you said, you, you said you took like a, a two, uh, like a, you did philosophy for a couple of years, like failed miserably and then like took a step back and then came back to it later. Well, I mean, my, my intended major was philosophy, but the first two years of college is just prerequisites. So right. yeah, I didn't do very well. But when I came back, so I have like a 2.4 GPA or something. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, I was on the verge of failing after a couple more class. And then I had to come back and like uh, really work my butt off to get uh, a better grade. And then finally I, I moved into, um, I finished my degree. I got my philosophy bachelor's degree. Then I went to Malaysia and did my master's in philosophy. So I was in philosophy program for like six years. Yeah. You know? Would you say that... Um... What would you attribute like the, the low GPA to? Is that, do you think it's an issue of 
where you just didn't know how to study or were you lazy, unmotivated? What was the what was challenge? A lot of factors. I mean, a lot of it was lack of motivation because, you know, I was still kind of depressed. I still had a lot of things. I didn't really fit into an academic environment because I didn't come from that background. So it was also, I think, communication issues, feeling uncomfortable in an academic setting, you know, like, because I was very, I felt out of place. You know, I'm not supposed to be here. Like, even the way I talk now doesn't, it's not how I was when I first came in, you know. Um, I saw your post about that the other day. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) And you've heard me talk like when I get comfortable, right? Yeah. So, so you know, uh, but yeah, I try and I, I, it was all just very new to me and alien. And I was, I was not prepared for it. I was not prepared to be in that sort of world. You know, I was used to hitting people in the face and getting money for it. So that was my thing, you know, and then uh, now I'm trying to study and read and, and honestly, like, you know, I, I, <laughs> I portray myself as this intellectual. I don't do it on, I don't try to do it on purpose, but you know, like maybe people perceive me as that way. But when I initially came into the university, I was nothing like that. I didn't understand how to read things properly. I mean, I had to learn everything myself. Right. So it's funny when people say, well, you think you're, you know, I get this sometimes because I can be a little cocky. You know, they say, you know, you're, you're arrogant. You think you're a genius. I'm like, I don't think I'm a genius. If you would have seen me the first year of university, (laughs) I was an idiot. And the reason I'm cocky is because I had to struggle to get to, to, to achieve what I, whatever I do have now, you know, Mm -hmm. even the way I speak, like I had to train myself to talk different, you know, you know how difficult that is coming from an underprivileged background and not having that experience, you know, just thinking about how to make money, you know, and things like this. And then you go into, now you want to be an intellectual, you want to be an academic. It's like, that's a whole new world. I mean, I, I definitely, um, wouldn't because because I, I didn't know you i didn't know you in chicago it's funny how mm. after we connected online we've never met in person yeah you know, hopefully that job changes you're in georgia yeah. these days yeah i'm in georgia now so it's like uh but once we i remember we recorded for yakin institute that's when you first connected and i was like wait a second we know like the same people and it's funny because yeah. I, I was sending you pictures of an event i think we were at the same event yeah <laughs> and i was like oh like back in 2008 yeah yeah <laughs> And was, it's funny you mentioned that too because like uh i saw some of those pictures and i remember those events right yeah and i was actually during that time that i was still kind of like you know not very sophisticated person right so i still had a lot of that you know that kind of the hood hood talk and everything like that and people were turned off by that actually i couldn't talk to some of the other muslims because they didn't understand really why i was the way i was they thought i was just some like low class kid and i was just like which i was kind of <laughs> you know but i was uh, i'll tell you a story so in light of your post the other you know, story you mentioned how like there's this phenomenon like um <laughs> i guess we yeah. laugh because i mean so like a little like people ask me like i don't know if people get that people say i, I give off that vibe as well and i explain to them no, that, I, don't. I can tell you're fine man what <laughs> i can tell you're not like that <laughs> <laughs> no but like people like because but i did like i said i said before like i went to school like i never lived in a bad neighborhood i yeah. would say I, I i grew up in like uh student housing kind of such set setup but like it's more like where I, the kids i went to school with hmm. during my development year developmental years uh but uh I remember I had a friend, we, he was in town for an Al class, like 2008, 2009. And it came to Chicago and uh, he was, and he's from, he's from Cincinnati, Ohio. And he was like talking. And so one of the guys from Naperville, like asked him, like, why do you talk like that? <laughs> oh, he's talking like, oh, he's talking like he's one of the bros. Yeah. But like, he was like, and he was, my friend was like really offended. Right. Really? He was oh. like, because, was he black? No, but his thing is like all his friends were black, like his best, like, you know, he grew up in that environment Yeah, and he was just like, but he was also, my, my, my friend's dad's a, a physician. So they were like, yeah, but he sent him to like these like parochial schools where all his friends were like black. Okay. Kind of thing. So that's how he grew, he grew up with those. And it's not like, um, a it's not like super like like you see it's soup like super hood is like when you're dropping the n-word like every other lie oh when i hear an arab guy say the n-word i'm looking i'm like Bro, i won't even <laughs> say that around my black friends you're trying to talk like that like seriously <laughs> yeah 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 so it's just like and, and and now you've got like um things like um you know I, i've heard people like use different like 
consonants instead of n oh yeah yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> but uh yeah it was just uh, so but you know don't you th- like so it seems like you were hanging around like a bunch of like your exposure to islam was a benedictine then yeah yeah actually that was it that's the first time i ever heard of islam really was on i mean like i've heard of it but like i didn't even see i never saw like a hijabi oh okay until like i hear you it's it's almost yeah i'm like that way with like i don't know i'm trying to think of some maybe like sikhs i guess i've heard of sikhs yeah same thing i've i've met i've met sikhs but not like i don't think i've actually had a conversation with sikh who actually has the get up i've seen them on tv yeah right um but yeah so uh you're you're a benedictine and you come across islam like what you just saw hijabis and you were like oh what's this or i mean like like i said i had some very basic understanding but i kind of just stayed away and not really engaged too much um i mean it wasn't until i actually got into my philosophy courses that i met a brother in there who was you know muslim yeah and uh he started talking to me about islam and i was really interested because i was like i was going through that sort of existential crisis about my beliefs and stuff Mm -hmm. and doubting my christianity and then um he invited me to his masjid he was he was shia though and um you know and over like a period of like six months or something i I actually had very deep detailed philosophical discussions with his imam you know and that's really what convinced me eventually about the theology of islam and And of course there are differences between shia and sunni but generally speaking about islam just generally speaking like it made a lot more sense to me and that's the reason that i you know i I eventually became convinced of it so why not shiaism well that's initially what i converted into okay yeah you know uh but it it didn't last very long because the more that i interacted with sunnis and i kind of understood the theology a little bit more and and I understood the sources a little bit more and I kind of, I became more attracted to Sunnism because it felt more coherent, felt more, un, you know, it, it made more sense to me. Um, it felt like the, like the whole 12er, because I, I converted to 12erism when I first came in, I didn't know really the major differences, but um, the whole concept of the imamate, like, you know, the infallible imam thing just felt like very superfluous to me. Okay. Like just wait, like there's no need for this, you know? And when I read more about the history behind what was going you know it's my personal view obviously i and i think it's right but um i'm not trying to offend any of your shia <laughs> member of the audience but it did feel superfluous to me it felt like it was unnecessary and that uh it didn't really do anything to add on to the theology and that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi was was, a, was sufficient you know for our faith and so that's really my biggest attraction to sunnism at the time and then i just became sunni after that so would you um i've always tried i've always juggled this idea like because like not muslims will ask me like what sunni and shia is how do you know one's like right versus the other and what i what i try to tell them is that like um there's a lot of the assumptions you have to make mm-hmm. to be a shia kind of like deconstruct automatically like because we inherited the religion from the companions. Yeah. Okay. And if we start accusing them of sabotage, right? Hmm. It like kind of like, then we're like, okay, then we have to start questioning everything. Hmm. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's that and that. And, you know, it's also because, um, you know, I heard at least from my, from what I understand, I heard from my Shia friends, you know, the Quran apparently was, altered and things like this you hear all this really crazy stuff that just really undermines the foundations of the faith right and you have to just believe the imams that all of this stuff was you know and it's like i can't do that <laughs> um right it's it's like why do i have to believe the imams what's the yeah what about the prophet wasn't he sent for that reason like you know? well yeah it, it's like because the one thing that um if we want to like segue a little bit there's this whole thing of uh like as as people know, like when I when I got into practicing the dean, I was I came through the Salafi creed, like the authority understanding and whatnot, which I probably still attribute myself to. I don't think that I would call myself an Ashari or a Maturi. You don't, you don't have to be a you don't have you can be an authority without being a Salafi, right? <laughs> right so. Um, but I think there's like people for, and for people who aren't familiar, it's like this these theological schools. But I think the thing about the Ashari's that I've always, that I've seemed to like really respect it. It seems like there's this, like, they can like break down this progression. It's like when, like, even when, so I'll tell you, like, maybe we can, 
I, I took this class at a at a church two years like a couple years ago now, and one of the pastors we would meet after um, and just chat and kind of you know we we these friendly, these friendly conversations. Um, but uh, to me, I told him that like like because I would kind of walk him through the whole Kalam argument, hmm. and he would agree with it all. But I was like, yeah, but based on that, like, um, Jesus can't be, you know, he can't be divine. Because, like, if we believe that the creator is um, beyond time and space, then, you know, you're now introducing a divine, a, div a divine thing that Jesus, mm -hmm. that's within time and space. Yeah. that breaks the definition of what a God can be. So I would say it's like, not, it, 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 I, I saw what my arguments always have been like, um, that, you know, you cannot like saying that Jesus is God is like saying that a square is a, is the saying is a, a square is a rectangle, a square is a triangle or a circle is a square. Yeah. Because it's like you have to, and it seems like they seem to dismiss some of that. Um, you know, and then from there you can kind of break into okay. So once you establish the that the, there must be a god, then you must you didn't is the you weigh it. Would this creator like just leave you hanging, make you know create this entire universe, and then just be like, oh, have at it? <laughs> yeah. Or is there going to be some kind of guidance? Yeah. Right? And so it's like which one. It's like people, some people will argue, well, well, he probably just let it be. I'm like, well, is that what you want it to be? But what would make, do you live your life? Like I always ask people like, how do you live your life? Is it just winging stuff? Or is that like, are you weighing things yes. out? <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know? So it seems like people like are just being this. And then you kind of like, I don't know. I, I haven't heard good counter arguments. I, I, I and honestly, um, on, on the Christian side, because then now it seems like when you look at like what's going on with like these discussions about theology, the atheists have they they talk a lot about a lot of that stuff is over my head. They're talking they're talking about math and physics and all this stuff and oh, most of it's nonsense, you know. And yeah. I'm like, it's a bunch of noise. It sounds like it's just a bunch of noise, right? Mm -hmm. um, I try to follow this guy. There's this guy, um, Cosmic Skeptic, yeah, on YouTube, oh. <laughs> you know. And and I and I'm hearing him talk to Dr. William Lane Craig. Are you familiar with Dr. William Lane Craig? I am. Yeah. So like I'm like okay. I, I pretty so I more or less agree with Dr. William Lane Craig's pre, you know premise when he's talking and, and how he's walking through. And the guy he's got to concede to him. He's not like he can't really refute what Craig is saying. Now Craig falls apart because Craig then adds in. And he's like, oh, Islam can't be true because you know God. If God is like um, like the attribute of love is if he's eternal and he needs some he would need something else, and I'm mm. like, well, why? Like, why does he? he so it, it's interesting how they like try to like sneak in these like little assumptions. Oh yeah, you know, and people just like, but if you're already a Christian, you'll buy it. Yeah, of course. I mean, everyone, I mean, that, that's, we can speak about that for everyone. You know what I'm saying? Like the thing is too, it's for me, that's also why pragmatism kind of helps me to, to really uh, demarcate between truth and fiction, as well as uh, what things I should actually focus on. I look at, you know, is it coherent or is it too convoluted? You know, is it, is it necessary to think this deeply about the thing or is it not? Is it even necessary to think about the subject or is it not? You know, so for me, you know, even like a lot of theological discussions among Muslims, I don't care about. Like the moment I start hearing that there's Asharis and Mataridis arguing with each other, I just walk away because I'm like, this is dumb. Like, there's no reason for me to have this discussion. <laughs> like, you know. Well, what, on that note, what, 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 what are the dumbest things you think Muslims argue about these days? <laughs> oh, Since God. you brought it up. <laughs> Do we have to get into this? <laughs> so, <laughs> just look at Twitter. <laughs> so, um, oh my God. Um, well, it seems to me that Muslims are, are busy trying to make things a matter of deviance when they're not. Uh, you know, like actions, behaviors that that have 
sometimes very innocuous things. They try to read deviance into things people say or do. Mm-hmm. Things are very, some things are very explicit. A lot of times they're not. Like yeah, recently, yeah. you know, I have, I, uh, I'm not even going to mention who these people are. I'm sorry, but I have to, I, I think you saw my post on it. So there's some people, there's some brothers out there who are arguing that because there are other Muslims doing compare and contrast of Christianity and Islam during Christmas to talk about Jesus, you know, the, you know, how does Islam see Jesus versus how Christian, therefore this is indicative that they're kind of like they're perennialist, that they're trying to validate really? Christianity. No, I'm not joking. And I'm just like, you shouldn't call them perspectives. Only one of them is the truth. And it's just like, come on, man. Like, you know, the, <laughs> this is just ridiculous, you know? Um, and, and, and just stuff like this is very petty things I think that Muslims are arguing over just for the sake of making them feel themselves feel superior and not actually trying to gear for the truth. I mean, I feel like Muslims are at least online are, mm-hmm. are more concentrated on building themselves up by removing others from their circle. <laughs> There's a um, Twitter handbook that I purchased Oh God! I don't even. Well, I just <laughs> left Twitter entirely. I don't see the point. Uh, uh, um, no. Th- th- so there's a guy named Ed Lattimore. Uh, okay. he's, he's like he's a guy I've interviewed on my podcast. He's a pretty successful. He's pretty successful, I would say. Cool. Um, what I'm thinking about doing with Twitter is that so Muslim Twitter. So Muslim Twitter, like you alluded to, it seems like there's first of all there's what you see is a lot of it is being upset with what other Muslims say on Twitter, and then like quote tweeting it right yeah and um oftentimes reading into stuff more um, often <laughs> like into the area, reading yeah. it like making assumptions virtues like this your virtue signal your virtue signaling here and you're, 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 mean ga- this you're gaslighting this? you yeah. know etc um and i think that there has to be some there i don't know if it's almost like there's gotta be a muslim out there on twitter twitter Who's beyond Muslim Twitter? Who's tweeting about all kinds of stuff? Is there a is there like there's no because because what happens is like, and I, I don't know how your what your perspective is as as someone who came into the religion, but we always want to do the Muslim stuff. So right now there's too many damn Muslim podcasts. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. I have a gripe about this. I have a gripe about it not because of competition in that sense. I think competition is good. I think it's redundant. Yeah. It doesn't seem like there has any value to it. Like, There's what's no the point? And some of them are so damn are boring. They're, you know, you're you're going to listen to um, some guy who's, you know, it, it's just like they see with, with, I don't know, with Mad Mamluks, we started. And I know Sim helped out all these people that get going. Like 20 people reached out to him. I think only the boys in the cave, the only ones that actually stuck. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think they've got like a specific niche. So I'm like, all right, you have a niche, you have a certain angle that you're going with. These are, these are kind of topics you're going to cover. That's cool. But I think when you have people who are just doing podcasts, for the sake of doing podcasts, like people aren't asking, I think Twitter is the same way. It's like, well, I got to be on Twitter. That's where the action is. Like what action? <laughs> right. You boost your ego. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, but, but I, but I think Twitter, the way I look at Twitter, the reason I purchased this book, by Ed Lattimore is that like you are like there yeah you are I mean at the end of the day it, there is that element of yeah my I look at my following I'm like my following is not high enough because all obviously like pe- maybe I'm like I'm many people won't openly say it but like the goal of doing a podcast like this isn't to like stagnate at like 200 subscribers forever yeah, no, I mean, I get it. I mean, the thing is, we're doing it right now. I'm just hoping that there's any benefit. Anytime that I involve myself in a podcast, yeah. my whole perception is like, I hope that somebody can get some benefit from this, you know. Um, and most of the time, I don't talk about like drama. Or I try not to, unless yeah. I have to, you know. But uh, I get it. Like, there are too many podcasts out there, and it doesn't seem like anyone's really talking about anything beneficial. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to knock you or Mad Malmux or anybody either. I mean, we yeah. brought up this conversation, but right. it does seem that there's a lot of stuff that focuses too much on drama or, you know, doesn't have any practical benefit other than like, I don't know, entertainment. It's like, it's what do you call manufactured. A lot of it's manufactured drama. Yeah. Right? It's it's manufactured. Now, you know, you're, you're basically jumping on um, 
I can't, I, you know, and sometimes it's like, you know, there, there's always a lack of, so there's this whole incident with like so-called community leader, ex-wife, all of a sudden people have to chime in on it. Oh, I didn't even hear about that. I'm glad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, but it's, it's, it's like, obviously it's like, you know, you know, you know, I think I said this before. It's like, we don't have to have an, we don't, I don't know, understand why there's this pressure to like have an opinion on everything. And then everyone is like, everyone you know, wants to talk, man. Everyone wants their opinion. I just, I just saw a lecture by Abdul Hakim Murad, mm-hmm. um, you know, where he talks like, he says like, everyone wants to have an opinion on, so everyone needs to be heard because their significance in life essentially is basically getting their opinion out there as though it has some sort of value. You know, yeah. it's like, everyone has to do it because that's the only way they can make themselves feel important or significant mm-hmm. it's like you can do a lot more by just being quiet <laughs> you know? uh most people need to shut up <laughs> honestly right it, it, and so what I, what I struggle with personally is that you have this whole deal like where you have social you have to have when you have a podcast you have to use social media to like drive essentially awareness of the podcast yeah uh, of yourself which is a you know thing that I, I was um it's funny because it's something you struggle with because there's there's this whole like i don't know if you've heard of this guy named michael sugich yes i have you know um so i've yeah he so he's he wrote this book you know hearts turn he's you know he's traveled and he's met, met these like sages in the muslim world so we were um i was on a zoom call with him a couple of weeks back and i kind of asked him this and i was like you know what are your you know when you have like when you're a content creator and you're driving you're that's a, and the thing is, the community leaders, like if I ask them for like I don't, someone that maybe you and I hold very dear, I'm not going to mention my name, but like I remember when I was telling him about our podcast, like Mad Mumloos, when I first, when we started back in 2016, hmm. he was like, oh, how many, how many downloads do you guys get? Really? Right. So it's like, that's like the type of, and, and I've noticed that people in the community react. And sometimes people reach out to me, somebody reached out to me to come on Mad Mumloos. All right. And I was like, well, I don't think I can get you on Mad Mom Luke's because like I'm not the f- Yeah. I, I I like I don't I don't think you would get approved for it, but you can come on my channel. Yeah. Right. And then this person kind of ghosted. It was like, oh well, you know, we had something scheduled and then like 15 minutes before it was like, oh sorry, I, I got something come up. Can we reschedule? And then I was like, sure. And then like I gave some dates and I goes got ghosted, right? And I was like, all right, it is what it is. But I think a lot of it is this platform is much smaller hmm. you know this is two i'm at four three hundred and some subscribers mad mom looks at eight thousand on youtube etc it's it's what people know right and yeah. so it's like people like like we i i think we just own up to the fact that we want more followers people and and, and that's what the community respects i think it's a <laughs> it's a double-edged sword in the sense that just giving you my personal experience with this I no longer care about views or followers. I mean, I know that may seem miraculous or, you know, ridiculous to say, but I've honestly moved away from that because just for my own personal benefit, you know, and, um, but initially when I was opening like my YouTube channel and my you know, Facebook, my initial intention was like, I need more followers because in order to get, the, when you have more followers, it's like marketing. It helps to get your views out there. That's the only way you can become influential. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of people right? It's sort of a double-edged sword. Like you have to have a lot of people in order to be influential, but in order to be influential, you have to have people to join you, right? Right. And right. at the same time, or it's paradoxical, excuse me, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword in the sense that like your ego kind of gets involved in that because like when you say, I want more views, it's like, yeah, you want more attention. And then that, that initial intention of needing those more views in order to be influential, it, it mixes. You can't get rid of it. Like it's like yeah. they, they, conf- they, they, they get mixed into each other. So there's a, there is some ego involved in there though. At the same time, I can't deny that there is a practical reason why you want more views. You want more subscribers because you want your views to be heard. You want to influence people, right? You want to do something positive for the Ummah, especially if you're doing Dawah, right? I, w- yeah, of course I wish I had a hundred thousand subscribers so that people watch my videos and not be, not listen to idiots. Well, but. I-, I think, okay. Um, you know, we on Mad Mum looks, you know, some of the guys will say we're doing Dawa. I don't think it's Dawa. <laughs> Sorry. 
I wasn't talking uh, about Mad Mom looks. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying. I, I, but since you mentioned, like, we talked, like, so for me, I, I'm very upfront that I think that, like, um, my, my goals are, like, okay, the reason for more views is that it creates more opportunities. Okay. Yeah. So that's you a know, reason. You know, down the road. Because the more you, and again, my channel, the reason, one of the reasons is that, um, I don't like limit myself to only Muslim guests or mm -hmm. Muslim topics is because we're such a small, you know, again, it's about, you know, reaching more people, but also like cr creating more opportunities because there's people that interest me that are outside of the Muslim space yeah. that I would love to work with. Right. Um, and so that's kind of the idea. And then, you know, when you talk about opportunities, you talk about, financial opportunities you talk about opportunities that can open up seg that can open up options for you to like diversify income and mm -hmm. you know a lot of us are doing careers that are not fulfilling and we enjoy some of these this kind of stuff and and it's like the idea is if we can do it um you know um for for if we can do it and make an income off it and put more quality into it then why not right but i agree with you it's extremely challenging to keep the ego in check. Well, that's the reason I had to leave. Honestly, I had to, or I had to stop caring about it because eventually like, you know, you go to the dark side, you know what I mean? Like, I don't care what people say these days. Like you got some of these people over, I don't care about the views, but the way that they behave, the way that they act, they obviously care about the views. You know what I mean? They care about their ego. They care about, they care about how they're perceived more than anything, you know? And right. the thing is I, I had, I can't, for me to be consistent with my, with my own criticisms, with my own self, you know, I had to also stop caring. I had to actually stop caring about those things and I had to step away. Um, so, I mean, there's a, a lot of reasons why, of course, I left this whole scene, uh, refutation scene and stuff like that, but that was one of them in that my ego was, was affecting the work that I was trying to do. And um, now, you know, the funny thing is I feel kind of liberated <laughs> that I don't care anymore because for me it's like now I can focus on things that really matter and that really make me feel um that I have some value in the community mm -hmm. um I, it's hard to express but like I I've noticed that since stepping away from like kind of caring about how many views I got on YouTube and Facebook and stuff like I'm focusing more on my family and focusing more on like you know things that I feel like in the long run will have a better investment will be a better investment for me. And uh, it's also helped me to be at peace with myself because now I don't care about what, you know, whatever, <laughs> like, I, I just feel like my life feels more peaceful. Like I'm just more calm and collected than I used to be. So it's a lot of benefit in it. So now I don't feel any regret for leaving all that stuff behind. What, um, w one, one thing that I always think about when, whenever, either I speak on social media or I speak, say something on a podcast or is that I think I always realized that like I run into people in real life. Mm. Right. Um, that people sometimes like you call keyboard warriors or especially when they're anonymous accounts, you don't even, you won't even see, they feel like you'll never run into them. And to me, I'm like, well, we, you know, we, we go to like conventions or now under COVID it's not as much, but how many times have I been approached in person by a listener or, you know, and it's like, you know, and when you say you meet people in real life, that changes, I think that changes the entire dynamic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like people are able to, you know, I was, I was talking, there was a, I was, um, there was one of our listeners on Mad Mom Luke's was, he, you know, he had messaged me this, this earlier today. It was kind of like, you know, we, we kind of have like a WhatsApp group for donors for Mad Mumlooks, right? And this guy was kind of like talking about how he um, he was like, um, I, I think I I I, th I think Sim's mad at me because of X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, Sim hates you, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. because you, I was like, well, then he probably does. But I was like, listen, like I I, I kind of gave him my point of view on his interactions. I was like, I was in the group. I'm like, listen, you guys, and, and it centers around, it centers around Jordan Peterson, right? I think yeah. there was like, you know, he, he kind of gave some pushback that, um, hey, man, you guys think Jordan Peterson's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and I'm like, 
I said, I was like, yo, bro, on the same show, I was like, I, I listened to his audio book, like two chapters, and I checked out. Yeah. Like, I couldn't get into it. Right? I what? I have a book of his. The 12 rules or whatever? I have it. Yeah, I have it. Yeah. Is it good? Should I read? Should I get through the whole thing or? I don't know. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, read it. Okay. Well, yeah. let me know. I'll, 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 I'll tell you. They're like, you should read this. And I go, okay. And oh, oh you, got, you got gifted to you. Yeah, so I, I haven't read it yet though. Yeah, I, I have it like it's part of uh it's, it's it's like I have a scribd, you know, and audible. And so I, I you know found it on scribd and I listened to like two chapters and I was like, I, I just couldn't get into it, right? Hmm. So like yeah, it just bored me. Like like this idea that but he's like, Yeah, but you guys treat him like this and that. I'm like, yo, but Sim loves Chomsky and he's all these other like freaking liberals. So how come no one cares about that? Yeah, I mean you know, it seems like a couple he, standards. They're they're you know, so I so I'm like I'm like, listen, bro, you should just call us. Like, you know, if you think that he's pissed at you, which he probably is annoyed because you guys are coming at you guys are talking over each other on WhatsApp in yeah. a group. And part of the group, the whole problem with Twitter and WhatsApp is like when you're going back and forth, you can't like be honest because you have to also impress yep. everybody who's watching. You and know you what I'm saying? Like, like your ego. You know, and that's I, I think that's what I noticed. I was like really disturbed what about I was I was pissed at myself for the situation I got into with you know the, the one brother that you know we know. Um uh, I won't mention my name, but like oh you know, you know what I'm saying? And there's people who were like uh, you know throwing out memes like you, you see, you know, you know the one meme where the guys are like about to fall down. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all that because it's all about people who are just like you know it it, it it, 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 it's and that's what I because like man this is all about the ego like this is like yeah th- it's like bad for my soul like really bad for my I mean, soul this whole entire di- I mean even I mean all of this is manufactured like you said at the same time I mean this virtual reality we live in the social media reality we live in right now this particular space is not realistic I mean the people who live outside of it when they when you interact in person these sort of disputes, these sort of nonsensical things do not occur. And one of the reasons I, th- I find um, anonymous individuals to be far more um, problematic is not so much that there are no consequences behind their actions because they're anonymous, but because they don't even realize the consequences of their actions or even can go through any true introspection because there are no checks and balances. They're, they're, they, they can just hide and be, you know, this world of Warcraft character that nobody knows about, you know, the, the real identity and get away with anything. And I, I, if I've seen excuses on Twitter before about an, an anonymity, like kids, these young kids saying, you know, it's good to be anonymous because then, you know, it's not about ego. I'm like, what are you talking about? How is it not about ego? How is it? Not, you're protecting your ego by being anonymous. You're protecting, you're not protecting it in the sense that you're not being egotistical. You're protecting it from being harmed. But if you're in person, like say, if you meet somebody in person and you talk the way that you do online, you would never do that. Not because you feel like the other person is going to hit you in the face or something. All of that is potentially possible, right? But because you know for a fact that that person has emotions, you know for a fact that there is some ridic- that there may be ridicule involved, that there's, you know, there's a real human interaction that you can't deal with, right? Because when we deal with each other in person, right? Like if I, you know, the way I'm talking to you right now, if we were talking on Twitter, I don't see your emotions. I don't see your, your facial expressions. I don't see that I'm actually hurting another person or human being. I'm not seeing your, you know, even you contemplating and being sincere or insincere with me. So there's a lot of miscommunication that, that's bound to happen. And also there's a lot of dehumanization behind these, these, these words, because these aren't, these aren't human things. These are just us. This is a medium by which we communicate with each other. Right. But if I'm in person, when I see you, you know, I'm going to be more cognizant of the fact that you're a person, that you have feelings, that you have emotions, that there's a real interaction here, a real relationship occurring. And as just a human being with a fitra, as a, as a sane human being who actually cares about other people, I'm not going to go out of my way to troll you, call you a simp or a, or, you know, a, a beta or all this other stuff, right? Unless these, of terms ex- did these terms exist when we were in college? No, unless of course you're being a dick. And then, of yeah. course, then I'll respond to you that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like the thing is, these kids don't realize that. And they're hiding behind this anonymous accounts because they know they can't have a real human interaction. That's why I don't call them men. I say you're being you're, you're being a child. You're being a coward, not because you're afraid that somebody's going to punch you in the face, but because you're not even you don't even have the courage to have a normal human interaction with somebody that you have to hide yourself like you're that afraid to be called out 
as you are as a person, as a normal person, you know, it's sad. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I, I noticed there's certain points in Twitter we're using, and I don't, I don't know why Twitter itself is the, is the biggest problem. Like Facebook is, I guess the, the, the nature of Facebook's different. Um, Facebook I've gotten in trouble, like, like some of my posts, actually not in my own posts, I, I'll share somebody else's posts. And then like, it just goes viral. Like I get more comments on these and I was tell them like, I just wish you guys would show up on my podcast. Yeah. Like, comment under the, on the YouTube sh- channel. Cause it's like, I, I think I, I, you know, so anyways, uh, I noticed something on Twitter where, uh, I, I, I think I, I, I did a positive review of the show Rami. Hmm. Yeah. I remember um, that happened. You know? And, yeah, know. <laughs> um, so one of my friends, a personal friend, like, I think subtweeted it like question mark confused, yada, yada, yada. I didn't reply to him. Yeah. But why so I'm you? like, um, and, 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 and I'll tell you someone who's actually really good about knowing when to, like, if you know somebody, so I'll, I'll be friends to Sheikh Hasib Noor. I don't know if you know yeah, him. I know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know him, know him. I know yeah. him. You, you, you never met. No, I don't think so. Okay. So Sheikh Hasib is always someone that like, when we, um, on Twitter sometimes, and sometimes we'll, I'll just joke with him on Twitter or something, but he always messaged me on the side. Yeah. And to be like, hey, maybe we should take this to a conversation, like a phone yeah. conversation, That's like cool. real quick. That way it's just like, and we know each other, right? And I know that, and even then it still can be detrimental because I've seen it. I've seen it, people who like know each other have beef over some dumb Twitter exchange. I'm like, y'all know each other. You have his phone number. Like, why don't you like give him a call? Right. Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, the thing is, is it's dehumanizing the way that yeah. we talk to each other on Twitter, to be honest with you. It's really dehumanizing because we don't treat each other. And it's funny, too. These people going around saying, Ahi and, you know, bro. And I'm like, you don't treat me like an Ahi or a bro. You don't treat other people like an Ahi. You know, you don't you're not acting. You know, if you really, truly believe that this is your brother or sister. Yep. You don't you wouldn't behave like this. Brothers and sisters don't talk like this to each other if they care about each other, right? Like yeah. this whole thing with the criticism culture now, it's like, oh, you know, I'm trying to help the ummah. No, you're trying to humiliate the ummah. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to say here you care about people. You don't care about anyone if you treat them like this. Imagine if you're if the person you love the most came out on Twitter like that and did that to you. How would you feel? You'd be feel betrayed. Like, oh, no, 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 I'm just doing nasiha. No, you know for a fact that it's not nasiha. You know, um, this and happened course, to us. We, you know, it had, it had, it, we, we ended up having to pull the show. There was a show that we did a couple of years ago that's really, um, I wasn't on it, but it was one of, one of uh, a respected scholar in our community mm-hmm. who's actually close to us, and specific, specific, specifically close to one of our own members. Yeah. Um, you know, so at, at the time we had a lot of contributors. Mad Mum Looks has gone through different phases and stuff. Like, so I think the constant stuff has been the four of us current hosts like we've been there for you know i i came in a few months after but you know other three guys but there was a point in time there was like a bunch of extra contributors a couple years back yeah right who were like a lot of different hosts coming in so there was a show that's kind of like a hit job on this guy on this imam about a position he took and i was kind of like yo that was kind of messed up meaning that we did that because we could have just called the guy and got his take and then the response was well you know, we feel like he's so he, he's so down with us. If he would have just hit us up, I'm like, nah, man, I'd be pissed. And I and I reached out to him later, and he was pissed. Yeah, of course. And fair it, enough. It feels betrayed. I mean, why would you, you know? Hit right. Yeah. On somebody it's, like that, it's like right. Cares, like I've had people I've known. You know, I'm not going to name names, but you know, yeah. when I was on Twitter before, his brother was around when I converted. We converted around the same time. He went eventually. He went off to study. I went off to study. We went different paths. You know. Mm-hmm. And um, I met him, like I talked to him. We worked in the same place for a long time. He starts calling me out on Twitter. I'm like, you know, and this is like a couple months prior to this. I had asked if he would be interested in marrying my Mm sister-in-law. Like, and I was just like thrown off. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you serious? Like, you're trying to call me out like this and, and, and treat me like, uh, like I'm just one of your, you know, one of these trolls that you refute on YouTube or something. It's like, no, man. If I made a mistake, fine. But, you know, if you actually cared about me, you wouldn't be doing it for views. You wouldn't be trying to do it to, to garner attention for yourself. Oh, I'm trying to point out deviance, trying to help the community. If you were trying to help the community, you would think that I would be part of that community, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Am, are, am I not part of that community? Am I not part of your, am I not one of your brothers? Mm-hmm. So why don't you treat me like that? 
before you go out and blast me in public and try to humiliate me, make, make me into an example for you. I'm not one of those ex-Muslims and Islamophobes who are trying to trash. Right. You know, and this is what we're doing now on Twitter and YouTube and elsewhere. You know, it's ridiculous. I'm sorry I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. But, you know. We'll see. Anyways, <laughs> what, what, what else, as we wrap up here, what, what else is going on? Anything you're looking forward to? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I feel like we, 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 we covered the bases there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, honestly, like, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm, I'm opening this, I'm trying to open this institute on my YouTube now. Uh, just teaching people. I'm just doing lectures now, hopefully on yeah. um, on like information literacy. So I'm hoping to upload my first video tonight, inshallah, and open registration. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be traveling tomorrow to New Orleans. So just for a quick trip. For the Sugar Bowl? No, I'm just going there. Uh, <laughs> me and my wife's last excursion before the baby's born, uh, inshallah. So uh she wants to go visit new orleans and try the food and stuff so that's you don't uh yeah you don't get my reference so the sugar bowl is a game that's being played friday night in new orleans All right. oh, okay well i don't it's a football game yeah I, that's I, probably I, what I, you're able to cop you, you, like what are your vice do you are you into video you you say you i thought you were a, a, a gamer you, oh, you're i love video games. games yeah i love video games so video games is your is your thing that you're like your time waster that's where i go to escape yeah, whenever I don't play just like, any, like I don't play online games. Okay. Because I know for a fact that if I did, I would be lost. <laughs> uh, so I play a lot of like story driven adventure type games. Like, you know, I'm a, and I make sure that I play games. I'm, I'm not the, I'm not like purest person in the world. I have some games there I probably should get rid of. But, uh, you know, like I try to play like games like Zelda and Mario, things that really bring me back to a more calm and simple time mm -hmm. and things that kind of inspire, you know. Yes. So are you trying to get the PS5? I don't really care about the PS5 or the Xbox, to be honest. I'm a Switch gamer, so... Okay, so you like old-school Nintendo. I love Nintendo. I've always loved Nintendo. For me, they've always um, they've always delivered. So I, I never... I know for a fact that if I buy a Nintendo game, it's going to be good. So I'm, I'm right. Yeah. You know, I've heard stories recently of, like, all the all the drama about some of the games coming out on PS5 and Xbox not, not working. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm glad. I've I never had, like, so I don't, I don't have a console right now. I mean, I actually have not only console I've ever had was the, it was the NES. The 8 -bit really? One. Yeah, no. Damn. That's the only one I've ever had. I, well, I got it in third grade. My, my dad hooked it up. Uh, that's charged, awesome. <laughs> charged on his credit card, 100 bucks back then. I that's think the box is still, yeah, we still have it. My brother had more stuff. For me, it's always been sports games. For me, following sports on TV is, like, the biggest vice. It's better than what most people do. You know what I'm saying? But like, <laughs> uh, I'm like, I mentioned a sugar bowl. So Ohio State's my alma mater. That's where I went to school, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So like, I bleed scarlet and gray. Like, it's almost like, I think people sometimes question my, like, they're like, is that your, is that your real religion? No. <laughs> because the way I, uh, but anyways, they're playing in the sugar bowl on Friday night. It's, 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 it's the playoff. Okay. It's, a, it's a semifinal game well, for the national. So they're in the final four. There. You know, yeah, so I figure we said New Orleans. I'm like, man, you gotta go to the Sugar Bowl. I'm just going there to eat. <laughs> you, okay, so have you have you been there before? No, first time. You obviously you know about Cafe du Monde. Yes, I'm going to Cafe du Monde. <laughs> I'm gonna have some coffee and a beignet, and uh, yeah. we're gonna have some gumbo after that. Maybe go around. We're gonna have all the seafood, obviously, because there's barely any halal stores. <laughs> but you know what? I, I've got like. Um, I could probably find out some halal spots for you. Oh, I, 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 a good friend of mine lives in New Orleans, one of okay. our listeners. So I'll uh, hit yeah. him up and be like, um, you know, what do you give me your list? Um, you know, so, you know, I'll, yeah, you know what? I'll, well, just ask Sheikh Omar. <laughs> Sheikh Omar. He's from here. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a native, right? He'd be like, hey. I, mean, I could ask him, but he's always busy. So he can hear, you know what? He'll reply to a message. Um, he, he he's always good for a reply especially something yeah. you know what a, a casual message like that he's probably that's what he wants he doesn't want something like hey man well when i message him i'm like yo sorry bro what's going on on twitter yeah. <laughs> that's what he gets from me like hey sorry about that i i mean i'm keeping i, I mean he would want something like hey drew Brees had a great game or yeah. something yeah i should do that i'm not really into <laughs> I tend to talk to him over like business and stuff. So we don't, or not business, but like just very serious matters. So maybe that's why. You know what? If the Saints win a game, I'll, I'll send him a text in the next couple of weeks. I'll be like, hey, nice win today with the Saints, man. You know, but <laughs> they'll, 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 you know, something like that. But yeah, I'm looking forward to Cobra Kai. 
coming out. Oh, yeah, that was random. Yeah, Cobra Kai is going to be awesome. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, yeah. Did, did you watch season one and two? Yeah, I've seen them. I binged them when they first came out. Yeah, it's drop. It's dropping uh, tomorrow night, man. Oh, I'm not. I I gotta. Yeah, I'll probably try to see it on a computer then because I'll be out. Oh, just wait till you get back, man. I just enjoy your time because like you yeah. you're gonna like it's that's gonna be what ten hours of TV. Yeah, it's true. But the thing is, like, we're probably gonna stay in the first night because like it's gonna be New Year's Eve. I don't want to go outside <laughs> during the nighttime. Yeah, so I'll probably stay in the hotel. And I gotta see because they say it's a January first release. So we got to see what time it is. Uh, oh, okay. So we don't. So we, I assume it'll mean, I think that means midnight. They okay. usually drop like the midnight up. So, so yeah, yeah. B- between Cobra Kai and these Turkish dramas that are like consumed my <laughs> life, <laughs> you know, I'm on, I'm off this week. But yeah, no doubt. But other than that, uh, yeah, appreciate you coming on. Uh, what's Thanks the link me. for your institute uh, for people to? Oh, I mean, online, just go to Facebook, Andalusian Project, uh, and Andalusian Project on YouTube. The website is up, but it's very basic, bare bones. It's andalusianproject.com. So, you know, thank you so much if you want to join. It's all free, by the way. There is no sign-up fees. There's no registration, nothing like that. You can take the courses all for free. And, uh, yeah, I'm hoping to release the first video tonight, inshallah, uh, or the very latest early next morning. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Oh, by the way, is there anything you're reading these days? You see all these books behind me that don't get read. <laughs> but I uh, a lot Mike by Beck bookshelf as well. Uh, th- uh, I recently started reading the um, um, the existentialist uh, survival guide, uh, which is pretty good. Um, just talking about Kierkegaard and things like that. That's something I'm interested in, though. It's probably pretty dry reading for most people. <laughs> is that something that requires like pre-reading? Not necessarily, but I think it requires an interest in the field. Okay. So, I mean, uh, he writes pretty well for the lay person, but uh, there's a lot of deep concepts in there and you have to kind of be interested in the subject. So I hear you. I hear you. All right. Listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at info at souls and the uh, For my special guest, Asadullah Ali Andalusi, I'm your host, Mahina Podcaster, signing off till next time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hit. Hope that was good.